Hello, uh, everybody. Um, and um, so I want to uh, introduce then uh, Professor uh, Venuti, uh, who is a uh, well known, and this is something of an understatement, uh, translator, uh, theorist, and a scholar. Um, he is Professor Emeritus uh, of uh, English at uh, Temple uh, University uh, and is the uh, author of uh, a number of, of titles um, that have had uh, a very, very significant uh, influence on how we think about the activity uh, of translation. Uh, just to name a few uh, titles, The Translators Invisible, Visibility, History uh, of Translation from 2008, uh, The Scandals uh, of uh, Translation, uh, an earlier book from uh, 1998, uh, Translation Changes uh, Everything uh, from 2013. Um, his thesis uh, on translation and organic Organ on for the current moment uh, from 2019. Um, and the book that will be very much the focus of our conversation uh, tonight, uh, which is uh, Contra Instrumentalism, a, a translation uh, polemic. Um, I should uh, also uh, mention uh, that the uh, translation studies uh, reader, um, the fourth edition uh, will be coming out at the end uh, of this month and that there is, uh, so uh, Lawrence Venuti has been the, uh, the editor of this uh, for uh, many years and um, it includes a greatly expanded uh, section uh, on uh, Asian uh, translation uh, theory. Um, so if um, I can um, see uh, Professor uh, Venuti, if he's coming up here on my my screen. Hi. Uh, I, um, so um, basically, I uh, introduced uh, you, although uh, you don't need much of an introduction in the uh, in the translation world. Um, so um, what I said um, is that we would concentrate pr uh, primarily on the uh, Contra uh, Instrumentalism uh, book because this is um, one of your latest uh, works, and, and I think is uh, a book that's important to you for, 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 for many reasons that you can uh, describe in the course of our conversation. Um, so basically, um, do you want to say why you wrote uh, contra, uh, contra Instrumentalism at this particular uh, juncture in your, your career? Yeah, great, great question. Um, I have to say that some of the issues that come up in the book have been there from the very beginning of my work, um, which is to say that I've been very interested in <clears throat> how translation is an interpretive act. This came up in the Translators of Visibility, uh, also in the Scandals of Translation. Uh, I've been very interested in the kinds of understandings of translation, the kinds of reception of translation that have kept translation back. Uh, that have marginalized it, that have made it misunderstood, that have led to its exploitation. So a lot of these uh, ideas have been, you know, kicking around uh, in my work. Um, but I think the way to answer the question is, is to really say that after the year 2000, uh, after that initial work, um, you know, was completed, um, my thinking about translation started to get more and more basic. Um, and I began to think about uh, issues, underlying issues. Uh, my work was always an effort to engage with current topics of debate in literary and cultural studies. Uh, <clears throat> uh, questions of uh, ethics, of multiculturalism, um, ideological issues. Um, but I began to think of, of more um, basic questions. And these dovetailed, these questions dovetailed with um, recent discussions of world literature. And uh, ultimately, uh, around, say, 2013, 2015, issues of untranslatability, which brought back uh, 
the whole question of how to think about translation. So my whole uh, idea, you know, finally was to address yet again from another much more fundamental point of view of why does translation continue to be treated so badly? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's one way to put it. Yeah. Why does it continue to be so dismissive, treated so dismissively? Um, why is there such misunderstanding about what translators do? Why are these, are there expectations that translators should be doing things that I think translation can't do? Um, and of course, how does this play into the cultural marginality, the neglect, uh, and ultimately the exploitation, the economic oppression, let's call it, that translators uh, continue to experience around the world? So that was, I think, the beginning of it. But um, untranslatability was uh, a key issue, and uh, that was something that I really had to come out against uh, as a translator, I, I think. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that um, uh, it was a dead end for various reasons. Hmm. Just taking the, because um, we, we, we look at this notion of, of untranslatability in, in, in more detail in a, in a moment, but just taking the, 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 the title of the book, Contra uh, in Instrumentalism, um, it, I suppose the first thing is, um, you know, how you would define uh, in instrumentalism you know, in, in translation. And, and secondly, how has that kind of contributed to um, what you describe as the, the, the paucity, the reductiveness and the sheer naivete um, that you, you find in certain areas of, of contemporary translation research? Okay, yeah, again, very, very important question. So my sense of instrumentalism, and then there are other, you know, versions of this concept in different kinds of fields and disciplines, you know, kicking around. But my notion of instrumentalism is that it's a model of understanding translation. Uh, it understands translation as the reproduction or transfer of an invariant contained in or caused by the source text, an invariant form, such as a style. Um, an invariant meaning, a semantic invariant, or an invariant effect. That what translation is, is uh, a, a cultural practice that concentrates on this invariant uh, in the source text, and it's an unchanging essence, um, regardless of the time the trans the text the source text was written regardless of the time when and place where the translation is made etc et so one of the things about this understanding of translation is that <clears throat> one of the scandalous things from my point of view is that it reduces translation to a matter of mechanical substitution um, the whole idea is the translator you know reads the source text um, perceives that invariant and reproduces it. Um, it doesn't allow for what I would call the creative and learned dimensions of translation, of all translation, not simply so-called literary translation, but humanistic translation, broadly speaking, or pragmatic translation or technical translation. Uh, all of them are creative and learned in a variety of ways. But if, if your model of translation, if the way you understand translation is instrumentalist, you will continue to hammer that invariant. Therefore, there are only right translations or wrong ones. And obviously, the right ones are those that reproduce the invariant. Okay? So this, this leads to um, a certain decrease, I would have to say, a certain limit uh, 
on how much time scholars, uh, how much time researchers spend dealing with translation. If translation is mechanical substitution, there's nothing to think about after all, okay? Uh, machines can do it, as we never cease you know, hearing said. Um, this leads inevitably to a certain reductiveness in the way that translations are studied, are understood, e even practiced. Translators can also be instrumentalists, not simply scholars or, or researchers of translation. And by reductiveness, I mean reducing the source text to an invariant, to a single meaning. Um, when the fact is that, you know, today it's easy for us to think about any text as supporting multiple and conflicting interpretations. And if that's the case, I would argue, uh, any text can support multiple and conflicting translations. And it, it's easy to show this. Um, it's easy to show if you take, um, you know, a canonical text and look at the history of the interpretation supported by that text and subsequently the translations. Um, the Bible, you know, Shakespeare, Cervantes, Dante, whoever you would like, um, Kafka in our own time, Proust, all of these texts have been subject to different interpretations on the one hand, but also different translations. So there's a reductiveness uh, that an instrumentalist notion of translation leads to, um, reducing the meanings of the source text and also reducing the meanings of um, translations then, the possibilities for translation. The, again, the creative and learned possibilities. Uh, it strikes me that what's at stake here also shows how naive um, instrumentalist understandings of translation are. And, and probably the best way to show this uh, is to, you know, just observe um, that the most common way to describe or explain and ultimately evaluate translations is to compare them to the source text. Um, <clears throat> this, I think, is utterly misleading because what happens always is that there's a prior decision about what the source text is, okay? That in order to perform this kind of analysis, description, whatever you'd like to call it, you've got to fix the source text. And then the analyst or whoever compares, often reviewers, sadly, compares the translation to the source text. But the naivete here is that there is no direct access to the source text. What is happening is that the analyst is comparing the translation to an interpretation of the source text. Um, it really begins with the choice of what we could call a unit of translation. Often a word is picked from the source text and then the so-called counterpart in the translation is compared to that word. But again, what is happening is that at least a couple of things. One is that the analyst is comparing the translation to the analyst's interpretation of that word, to the meaning often that the analyst has fixed for that word, okay? Um, but, you know, another point that, you know, any translator who is self-conscious, I think, you know, will immediately call attention to, and that is that when you translate, you know, you don't simply translate words. You're constantly moving between different units of translation. You look at words in sentences. You look at sentences in paragraphs. So it always depends, of course, on the genre or, or text type. But the whole point is that, you know, paragraphs occur within sections, within chapters. Um, there are larger units. And what translation ultimately is, 
the more you do it, is a kind of zigzagging between you know, different units uh, of translation. And the larger the unit, the more how a particular word, phrase, sentence will be construed by the translator, okay? Um, this is the creative aspect of translation. It's also the serendipity. This is where a whole element of chance comes in as you're working over a text. So an instrumentalist understanding, of course, cuts all of this out and insists on the invariant. But what is being cut out, I'm arguing, okay, in contra instrumentalism um, is fundamentally an interpretive act. Mm -hmm. And that we can get much farther. We can advance our thinking and our practice of translation and the way we account for the thinking and the practice if we start thinking of translation as an interpretive act. Just one thing that, that occurs to me is, you know, because what, what the way you describe it there um, seems to be, you know, perfectly comprehensible in terms of the experience uh, of, of, of translating, the experience of, you know, reacting to translation, um, you know, the kind of the, the, the plurality uh, of, 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 of meanings. But if that's the case, then why is it, you know, to use a, a, a phrase at one point in the book, is instrumentalism so heavily cathected with desire? I mean, you know, why does it enjoy the kind of popularity it enjoys if it seems to be so intellectually deficient in the ways, and culturally deficient and practically deficient in the ways you've described? Right, yeah. Why isn't this deficiency, you know, um, something that people are aware of, the instrumentalists, right? Why, why don't they get the message? Um, probably the best way to, to look at this, um, uh, I think, I, I would argue, is historically that instrumentalism, you know, uh, is still dominant today. Let's be clear about this. Uh, instrumentalist understandings of translation are very much with us, and they are dominant. Uh, even though there have been, you know, counter traditions and theorists and practitioners who have argued for a, a different, a more interpretive, or as I call it, a hermeneutic model of translation. Uh, nonetheless, instrumentalism continues to dominate thinking about translation, not simply, you know, with the so-called man in the street, but, you know, um, in the highest reaches of our culture and in academic institutions, instrumentalism is deeply entrenched. If we look at it historically, um, instrumentalism emerges in antiquity uh, as commentary on the translation of sacred texts. And um, so that when you, when you look at Jerome, where it's really consolidated, it emerges in you know, ancient Rome with Cicero, Quintilian, uh, and so forth, but when it's, by the time it gets to Jerome and, and gets connected to the translation of sacred text, the so-called invariant, okay, I'm, I'm calling it so-called, it's not so-called, I call it that, of course, um, but this, this unchanging essence um, is in fact God, it's divine revelation. So you can't argue that, you know, when you translate, you inevitably vary the source text according to what is interesting and intelligible in the receiving situation. That your interpretive act as a translator is something that changes, transforms the form, meaning, and effect of the source text. You can't say that if what is driving your translation projects is divine revelation. Um, and it happens, none, I mentioned Jerome, it happens not only in the West, it also happens in the East. The, the translations of the Buddhist sutras by Chinese translators in the second and third centuries um, uh, of the common error, Ji Chan, uh, or, or the editor, Dao Wan, um, they are not concerned like Jerome with dichotomies in which word for word versus sense for sense translation, 
has to be applied to translating sacred texts, okay? Um, they are more interested in, in what they call the plain sense versus um, a refinement, an ornamentation. And they are also, you know, very much em emphasizing what we could call, you know, a semantic orientation in translation. But whether it's Jerome or Ji Chan, um, I mean, Jerome's idea is, you know, sense for sense translation is a matter of the translator just reading the source text, perceiving the sense, and then reproducing that sense in the translation. The same thing with Ji Chan. You stick to the plain sense. You avoid stylistic refinement, ornamentation. And when you do that, you will get the Buddha's truth reproduced in your translation. Um, so the invariant, it, it depends on what the invariant is connected to. Uh, with a more secular culture, later on, what happens is the question of textual value takes a different form, a secular form, okay? The whole notion of canonicity, of a canon of literary text, for example. Uh, in, in this case, there's still this question of value. And the sacred text is secular, but it's authorial originality, according to different conceptions of authorship, of course, mm -hmm. authorial genius or whatever. And, you know, the invariant then becomes, you know, as as Pope would say, the style is the man. You know, you, you have to get that invariant in your translation, um, which is ironic, of course, in, in Pope's case, because he manipulated the source text in, in, in the case of, um, you know, Homer radically. But, but in any case, um, the notion of concepts of authorship as the bedrock of textual value takes over. It's a secularization of the sacred text. Um, what happens ultimately, I, I think, and we can't minimize this, to just add one more, um, you know, point. Um, I mean, your initial question is, why is instrumentalism so heavily confected with desire? And um, I, I think something else that we would need to figure in here, um, I mean, with sacred text and with um, secular text, we're talking about institutions, cultural institutions, the early Christian church, or you know, the university deciding you know, what texts are valuable, what texts are canonical, what texts are apocryphal. But um, what happens, uh, of course, when readers read text is that they have personal relationships with them and that they read their text, they encounter translations in relationship to other people members of their family, teachers, whatever. And um, the whole notion of um, the invariant or the whole notion of, you know, the translation as a vehicle of a source text gets caught up in um, um, an experience that's fundamentally psychological that is bound up with identity. Um, a lot depends on who is giving you your translations. Um, the, the key, one of the key texts for this is John Keats, that, that famous sonnet uh, on first looking into Chapman's Homer, where Keats was given Chapman's Homer by his mentor, uh, by Charles Calden Clark, who was eight years older than him, but was essentially his literary teacher. Uh, it was Calvin Clark that introduced Keats to Milton, to Spencer, to Tasso, to all those texts that formed him uh, as a poet. And it was also Calvin Clark with whom Keats read Pope's Homer. But there's that crucial night, October 1816, where they stay up all night, Calvin Clark and Keats reading Chapman's Homer. Uh, 
And the poem that he then writes, Keats, is an amazing example of chest thumping literary machismo, where he takes on the identity. It's, it's an amazing image. It's a colonial venture. Cortez, he's discovering a new land. He's rivaling Homer. Um, it's all about this kind of emulative rivalry, deeply edible. Um, and everything in that poem rests on an instrumentalist understanding of translation. Chapman gives us Homer. Homer gives us Apollo, the god of poetry. It's like a set of transparent windows. Amazing. So, um, you know, um, I, I think the thing about instrumentalism is that it's always intertwined with other cultural forms and practices. Um, these are then overdetermined by personal, you know, reading experiences. Um, the bottom line, <laughs> finally, is that there's a lot of fear of translation circulating out there because of instrumentalism. There's a fear that translators contaminate the source text, that they don't give us back the source text, that they don't, in other words, reproduce or transfer that invariant. So could, could, could I, yeah, uh, yeah, go could, ahead. Could, Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I was just thinking if, if just taking this notion of the, of the fear uh, of 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 translation, um, is that fear of translation expressed in, in another kind of dominant sort of trope or idea in the in the present moment? Uh, you know, which you, you flagged very briefly there at the, at the outset. Um, this notion of untranslatability. I mean, is is does untranslatability uh, carry with it particular kinds of dangers for 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 people who who want to think about practice or, or, or promote translation? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the new discourse on untranslatability. I mean, there there is an old discourse, of course, um, in, in the nineteen fifties. Um, Quine, Willard Quine, the analytical philosopher, um, wrote a marvelous, just an amazing uh, piece about uh, what he called radical translation. And he pointed to a kind of fundamental indeterminacy um, in translation. I mean, we don't need to get into that, but, but there is an older discourse, uh, this is my point, uh, of untranslatability. Uh, more uh, recently, uh, the philosopher, uh, the French philosopher uh, Barbara Cassin, uh, came up with the dictionary of, of untranslatables, and the whole idea is that you know the history of philosophy uh, in different traditions and different locales and so forth is a history of mistranslation, um, and because philosophical concepts are untranslatable. Um, the, the irony here uh, is that what she shows, this is a you know 1200 page encyclopedia uh, in, in French, it has been translated into English subsequently, but what Cassin shows um, is that it's not that these concepts are untranslatable, but that I would argue they are repeatedly, in fact, constantly made the object of reinterpretation. So they are constantly being translated, okay? It's not, it's not a question of untranslatability. It's a proliferation of, of translation, of interpretation. And, um, you know, why this occurs, you know, is, is a complicated question, but, it, but it, you know, it, it can be answered. So to talk about untranslatability may mystify the whole process of interpretation that I'm trying to argue is what translation is, um, and reduce translation to a matter of misrepresentation or distortion. That's that's the word that Barbara Cassin uh, uses. Uh, subsequently, of course, it was it was taken up by, you know, Emily Apter in order to attack uh, a certain you know dominant um, you know vein of comparative literature, uh, world literature. Uh, she was concerned about the too facile translation of, of text and the, the manufacture of this notion of world literature 
through multi-volume uh, anthologies uh, and, and so forth. Um, unfortunately, the term untranslatability becomes, you know, her code word, her slogan. This is the flag, you know, she wants to, to, to wave. But with all of these notions of untranslatability, I think one of the things for me is that you can't say something is translatable or untranslatable unless you have, unless you assume a concept of what translation is and does, okay? Uh, I don't want to make it sound more simple than it is, and it's not that simple, but that's the way I would put it. And one of the things that troubles me most about the discourse on untranslatability is that it assumes a concept of translation that seems to be deeply instrumentalist. Um, it seems to assume that there is this essence in the source text that should be translated, but that can't be. So it's untranslatability based on a failed instrumentalism. Or to put this another way, the discourse of untranslatability invokes instrumentalism only to show that it doesn't work. It should be forestalled, okay? So it's, it's a strange kind of give and take, um, but you can't make claims, once again, of, of translatability or untranslatability unless you have a notion of what tr translation is. And um, uh, this is a notion, I think, and the, the untranslatability that keeps translation back, that keeps thinking about translation back, that keeps the understanding, the research, the appreciation of translation back. Um, although when you read their work, the Kassans, the Aptors, and, and, and so forth, um, I mean, you're dealing with tremendously sophisticated readers here. But this whole notion of, you know, uh, assumptions uh, concerning models of translation, um, they just don't go that far. And, you know, why that is happening, you know, I, I you know, another yeah. thing to keep me up at night. <laughs> yeah, just, I mean, sort of following on from, from, from that about kind of how certain notions, certain ways of formulating ideas about translation tend to uh, block any kind of complex uh, understanding of the phenomena. Um, one of the things that you do in the the, the, the book, which is quite fascinating, is, is you kind of, you trace the, the, or the, the kind of the, the archaeology of, of certain kind of cliches or proverbs about uh, translation, such as uh, poetry uh, is, is what gets lost in the translation, uh, the uh, traditore, uh, traditore, uh, and, you know, and these, these kinds of things that are, are kind of tend to be trotted out uh, by, by, by people's on reflex action uh, when they mention uh, translation. Um, what, what made you do that? What made you kind of draw up a, a kind of uh, an infamous list of translation cliche or, 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 or proverbs of translation, as, as you call it? Uh, because I'm interested, I mean, the more I thought about this whole business about instrumentalism, okay, so Again, my opposition is there is an instrumental model of translation that emerged in antiquity, worldwide, east-west. Um, there is a hermeneutic model of translation, translation as an interpretive act that inevitably varies uh, the source text uh, according to you know, what's happening uh, in the receiving situation. That emerges in the late 18th, early 19th century with the German Romantics. And, and then, you know, it, it has a, a certain afterlife, you know, in philosophy and in literary theory and so forth. But um, these, the, the, these kinds of um, uh, developments are pretty much in high culture, um, academic institutions, you know, religious uh, institutions. And um, it's it struck me that you know uh, we need to think if we want to understand you know where translation is in any particular culture we can't just you know hang out with the cultural elites we need to understand you know what readers generally the readers for pleasure where where are they getting their ideas uh, about translation 
the journalists who are so powerful in you know changing opinions and forming opinions uh, about things like translation. What are their ideas? So um, uh, I started looking at what I would call cliches, um, dichotomies. I mean, word for word versus sense for sense uh, has become you know a horrible cliche. Uh, most writers would not use cliches, but you know. Writers have no qualms about referring to translation in, in terms of you know dichotomies that are you know over two millennia old. It's remarkable. So the question for me became, okay, what is what we might call the most widely circulated forms of thinking about translation? These are proverbs. And you know, proverbs like traditore, traditore, I mean, this is used in innumerable, innumerable contexts. And although it's an Italian slur, um, which according to my research, it's, which is not complete, I mean, I, I took it back as far as I could, and, and that was the 16th century. But although it's Italian, you find it everywhere. You find it in French, you find it in English. The, the fact that it's Italian means nothing, okay? However, the proverb always means the same thing. You know, if you're a translator, you're a trader. Um, and what I became aware of, of course, the Robert Frost tag, the U.S. poet, um, poetry is what gets lost in translation, is, is much later. I mean, that's early 20th century, early to mid 20th century. <clears throat> and then the, a third proverb that, you know, uh, I, I think should be classified uh, as, as one of these, you know, translation instrumentalist proverbs, ultimately, is uh, Jacques Derrida's notion that nothing is translatable, but everything is translatable. Okay, we, we can come back to that. But um, once again, uh, what I wanted to probe was what model of translation, what understanding of translation underlies these proverbs. So what I did was look at the way they were used. I, I went back to contexts and some very popular contexts, you know, journalism, letters to the editor, uh, prefaces that poets had, you know, written to their collections of, of translations. Um, and what I kept finding was this, you know, instrumentalism, that the translator is a traitor um, only because in the context where this is used, the assumption is that translation should reproduce or transfer an invariant, but never does, always betrays it in some way. Uh, and the same thing with Frost. Now, why these proverbs are used, the context, they vary. Uh, the thing about traditore, traditore, just you know, quickly to, um, uh, to mention this, is that that is used as a kind of satirical device uh, initially to um, berate translators who are regarded as incompetent on the one hand, but very, very quickly, okay? It's, it's, I found it first used in the 16th century in Italy, and then you know, within like 50 years, it's used in France, at, not simply to question the translator's competence, but to argue that poetry is untranslatable and that whenever poetry is translated, it's betrayed because of the poet's genius. This is du Ballet, okay? So um, it, it comes to have a metaphysical uh, notion that there is this, as du Ballet puts it, je ne sais quoi, in poetry that you can't translate, therefore you can only betray it. Um, so the proverbs, you know, unexpectedly for me, in this kind of detective work that I was pursuing in the research, exposed a whole set of different uses of instrumentalism. Um, and uh, none, I guess, so um, shocking as in Derrida. Yes, and I was going to uh, ask you about uh, 
Derrida, because I, I was initially surprised <laughs> to see uh, somebody as subtle and as, as complex as Derrida, you know, f featuring <laughs> in the kind of the uh, the villains list of, of, of translation uh, cliche. But your argument is that, in fact, this idea that uh, nothing is translatable, everything is tr translatable, has hardened into a kind of cliche that's actually preventing people from thinking uh, in, in translation studies? Yeah, exactly. You know, the um, the Derrida fanatics, uh, I, I'm one of them, I have to confess. But, you know, talk about the higher reaches of our culture. I mean, Derrida is, is a very important figure in, in literary and, and cultural studies and in, in certain, you know, varieties of, of um, f philosophy. Um, but the remarkable thing about, you know, Derrida's use of this, I mean, initially, when it, when it first comes up, um, it, it's linked to a kind of um, instrumentalism that, um, um, you know, where untranslatability uh, rests on a notion of the singularity of literature, that the literary text, the source text in this case, um, is so unique that it cannot be reproduced. Okay. Uh, as Derrida moves on, this whole notion gets qualified because he begins to imagine. Um, I mean, I'm not sure that this, you know, transition is here because he was such a uh, an amazingly, you know, subtle and um, self-critical uh, thinker. But uh, in later publications, the whole notion of um, uh, of translation as much, much more than word by word replacement. This comes up in um, what is a relevant translation. Uh, a very important essay, uh, I think, because he acknowledges that, uh, at least in the West, you know, he talks about Western philosophers, Western commentators on translation, the whole notion of translating one word by one word, a certain kind of economy of translation, which for him is also economic, a matter of economics, and not simply, um, you know, a structural relationship between the source and the translation. But um, he wants to move away from that, that within that regime of thinking, um, translation is bound by the contradiction. Nothing is translatable, but everything is. So, but he, he escapes it, um, reluctantly, it would seem, because uh, in that very essay, um, which involves a certain kind of discussion of Shakespeare's The Murder Venice, through the lens of translation, what he does is come up with a, a translation of, of a speech by Portia um, about the relationship between mercy and justice. And what he does is he uses a French translation that he had developed in a completely different context. Translating Hegel, the alphabone, okay, um, important, Hegelian concept. Um, my point is that Derrida felt like this was not really a translation, uh, even though it was one word by one word. Okay, the word he translated in the English text was seasons, and he used the word relève. Okay, sorry, I'm just going through this much much too quickly. But my point is that his choice of relève was a remarkable interpretive move. That his choice was deeply overdetermined by a whole intertextual connection, a philosophical concept that he brought in. He didn't want to consider this translation, but it was. It was really creative and learned at the same time. And it escaped the whole, you know, problem of instrumentalism that comes out earlier in the essay. Okay, so he taught us something uh, almost despite himself. <laughs>
Why was he so um, secure, insecure about calling this translation? Well, maybe because the paper in which he laid it out was first delivered to translators at one of those um, uh, conferences in the south of France at Arles, where the, the professional French translators get together, you know, uh, every year. Um, maybe he felt self-conscious that what he wanted to call translation wouldn't wash with this audience. Um, but for whatever reason, um, he finally gives us an example that I would call fundamentally hermeneutic uh, and escapes the whole circuit of instrumentalism that's caught up in that paradox. Nothing but everything is translatable. So difficult example. Michael, I've lost you. Are you still there? Great. Do you, I can't, can you hear me I now? can't hear you. Can you oh, hear you? yes. Yeah, good. Okay. Uh, so what I wanted to do basically uh, was, to, was to take you off in, in a slightly different direction, but still following the same line of inquiry um, and, and, and mindful of the fact that we will we, we move to questions fairly, fairly soon uh, from the audience. But it's the it's subtitling. Um, one of the, you know, the, the, the concerns of contra instrumentalism is, you know, the the harmful, the negative, the baleful effects of uh, instrumentalist instrumentalist thinking on on how subtitling is presented, uh, conceptualized, talked about, and also how uh, they're received. I mean, you you talk about the need to kind of uh, to 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 teach people uh, to read uh, subtitles the way you would any other kind of of, of literature. Um, so, uh, do, do you want to say a, a word or two about about that about the um, subtitling and instrumentalism? Um, one of the remarkable things about the way subtitling is is researched, um, but also the way it's it's practiced, um, is that the constraints, the technological constraints that um, trend, that uh, subtitlers are, you know, restricted to a certain number of keystrokes, you know, uh, you know, on the screen, usually at the bottom, but you know, with Asian languages or other languages, it, it may be, you know, um, uh, you know, in a column at, at a different margin and, and so forth. Um, but the thinking has been that no matter how much the subtitle reduces the soundtrack, no matter how little of the soundtrack may in fact be subtitled, because with some subtitled films, um, you know, you will have dialogue that's not translated in the subtitle also, um, that no matter that the constraints are you know, clearly enforcing a condensation, a revision um, onto the translator, what the subtitle gives us is still a semantic invariant. Um, this has been dominant in subtitling up until the present. It's still very much there. So it's, a, so it's kind of area within translation studies, within translator training, where, um, you know the the subtitler is is still uh, very much uh, a kind of instrumentalist hero. Um, I think it's easy to show that what has happened here is that a certain you know version of the translating language is privileged. It's it's always the current standard dialect. Okay, uh, for the most part. Okay, um, there is a manipulation where. It could be argued significant portions uh, that could enable the viewer of the film to understand characterization or or narrative differently have you know been cut out. Um, factors like this you know point to how instrumentalism really has a kind of you know mind lock on the way subtitling is studied, uh, subtitling is produced, written. Uh, but also the way it's processed by filmgoers. 
And, um, you know, I, I wanted to think about what would happen if we got rid of this. Uh, if we acknowledge that all a subtitle can give you is an interpretation and how the interpretation could be signified, um, how the interpretation, you know, really depended on ways not simply of writing subtitles, but of reading subtitles. Um, I mean, the fact is that readers, we still haven't developed a way so that as readers, we can read translated text as translations. Okay. We still can't do that. Uh, all of us need translations um, because we can't learn every language out there. Okay. I mean, uh, I don't want to leave anything unsaid here, no matter how basic it is. We all need to read translations. However, reading translations as translations, as in other words, texts that are relatively autonomous from the texts they translate because they're written in a different language for a different culture, different audiences. Um, that kind of relative autonomy is not something that we have learned or, you know, how to figure into our reading. Um, and subtitles struck me as, as potentially a strategic point of intervention. Um, because, you know, as a film goer who doesn't have the, the language of the film, you're, you know, talk about being a captive audience, you know, you're being tortured unless you read the subtitles. So you're forced to pay a lot of attention to the subtitle in the context of the audiovisual image. And uh, I began to wonder, okay, suppose the subtitler varies the current standard English as a way to inscribe a particular interpretation and became more inventive along those lines. Um, there's definitely been progress, if we're measuring progress in this way, in subtitling. And one of the uh, things about the pandemic is that it has made me, you know, watch more television. And uh, I'm watching much, much more subtitled material than I ever have before. And I'm becoming aware of how subtitles have really moved beyond, you know, the way they were 50, 60 years ago. Um, so that um, you're finding things like obscenities. You're, you're finding more non-standard forms, okay? So I wanted to imagine what non-standard forms what kind of opportunities that they would create for the subtitler to inflect the characterization being, you know, expressed through the visual image and the, you know, the auditory image. Um, and I, I think we're still uh, at an early stage, but, you know, you, you need to look at what's happening, for instance, in uh, what's called the Criterion Collection, which, which is a, a film collection where a lot of classic films are being re-subtitled. And um, if you had the experience of the earlier version, as I often did, um, you know, and, and then the newer version, you do see, you know, uh, a remarkable kind of sophistication entering into, you know, the writing of the subtitles. It just wasn't there before probably because subtitlers were paid very little and, you know, gave up any right in, in their, in their work. Uh, we just, yeah. you know, hired for, you know, by a distribution company. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, I think one of the things is the, yeah. the conditions in which subtitling uh, have taken place. And, but what is nonetheless interesting and it echoes what you're saying is that, um, you know, with the online streaming of, of material and, and also the kind of the, the particular conditions of, of the pandemic that the people, the, the exposure to subtitle material has increased exponentially. So it'll be interesting to see what the, 
the, the consequences are in, in terms of, of responses. And there's a, a lot of questions have uh, come in here, uh, Larry, on, on the, 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 the chat function. But I, there's one question here from uh, Leah Cyrus. Um, where uh, couldn't the notion of uh, traditore uh, be understood not as referring to some kind of genius that is betrayed, but simply to the problem that each text contains a multitude of aspects and is not always possible to capture them, uh, or especially in poetry where every little aspect is likely to be meaningful. That is when translating, you might have to sacrifice one, some aspect is to save another. And this might be felt by some as a kind of betrayal of the source. So uh, is there, there might be a suggestion there by, by, by Leia that um, it's the misunderstanding of the hermeneutic act of, of translation that, that, that leads to these kind of ritual denunciations. Is that, is, is that a fair um, point? Yeah, okay. That, that seems to be, that last part, very interesting, seems to be your interpretation of the question. Right. Because the question uses the term capture, that we right. can't capture all the dimensions, you know, of the poem. Um, so it's not a question of, you know, the poet's genius. It's that the translator, for whatever reason, we can call it the structural differences between languages, the, you know, literary differences between poetic traditions, which develop at their own speeds differently and, and so forth. But, you know, whatever. Um, that we can't, there are obstacles for us to capture the dimensions uh, of the poem. Uh, the first thing I want to say is that that is instrumentalist rhetoric. Uh, translation is not about capturing anything. Translation involves constructing a structural relationship to the source text that we could call a matter of equivalence. But that equivalence is certainly not an identity. It's a correspondence. Translation can construct a semantic correspondence to the source text. According to dictionary definitions, however you'd like to measure it, it could also develop a, a stylistic approximation to the source text. But neither of these things, a semantic correspondence and a stylistic approximation, will stop the transformation that a translation always entails in relationship to the source text. Okay. Why? Well, a poem is a complex cultural artifact. It, it is much more than a semantic correspondence and a stylistic approximation. Okay. Uh, the question, I mean, because, you know, any text supports meanings, values, and functions that are specific to its originary culture. And that is gone with translation. Um, I don't want to call it a loss or, or any gain in translation. What I'm advocating here is translation without tears. Translation is an interpretive act. And every interpretive act is partial. You can define partial however you like it. Every interpretive act will not, no interpretive act will give you back the object of interpretation, the text, the film, whatever, um, in some intact way. Interpretation is mediation. If you want that text, you've got to, learn the language, immerse yourself in the culture, and read it. But you're still going to be interpreting it, okay? There is no direct access to the source text. We only have interpretations. And that's where the value of translation is. Coming up with an interpretation that accrues value in the receiving culture in relation to the source text, always, certainly. But the assignment of value, that accumulation of value, happens in the receiving situation. So a translator can hope to come up with an interpretation that enables the source text in translation to make a difference in the receiving culture. 
But even in saying that, I'm already formulating a theory of value in translation. So I'll stop there. Great. Um, I just there's a question here from Barbara Spicer. Um, uh, so Barbara says, I think one way to counter instrumentalism is in translation process research, which investigates literary translators working on commissions in naturalistic environments. My own PhD research, the literary translators early drafts are full of alternative translation solutions, showing the plurality of possible and equally valid renderings. Uh, why does uh, Professor Venuti think that there are so few translation process studies, except get the example of Borg and, and Kolb, which focus on contemporary literary translators, highlighting their uniqueness, humanness, and, cre and creativity. Hmm? Um, right. um, a very long time ago, um, in the discipline known in the US as composition and rhetoric, there was a book called <clears throat> Writing as Social Action, I believe the title was. And one of the things it did was <clears throat> essentially submit to what many thought, and, and, and I, uh, I think subscribe to the many, um, was you know, a devastating critique of think aloud protocols. Think aloud protocols, of course, is, is one of the main methodologies for process research. You can also have interviews with translators. Uh, think aloud protocols require translators to talk about what they're doing while they're doing it. Okay? Um, but now what has happened is that we've moved on. And uh, there was a time when there was more neuroscience was involved. And, and that has to, you know, um, <clears throat> you know, developed into eye tracking uh, and so forth. Um, I think the main problem is, is that, you know, when the translator is working, the translator, you know, you, you can't expect the translator to interfere with the process without affecting the process. Um, the thing about eye tracking is that, you know, it, it quantifies levels of attention, but it doesn't qualify them. It doesn't give us a sense of exactly, you know, what the translator is thinking about. Um, I want to look at translation as a linguistic and cultural practice in which the translator thinks about, you know, not simply the source text, the source language, and the source culture, but where that's coming into the receiving situation. Um, I want to look at translation as a cultural and social practice whereby the translator thinks out, you know, the possibilities, admitting that the translator cannot think out all of the possibilities. There are always unacknowledged conditions to any act of translation, uh, nor can the translator anticipate every possible effect that a translation might have when it begins to circulate, publish, uh, et, et cetera. So there's always unanticipated consequences uh, as well. You can regard this as the kind of socio-political unconscious uh, of translation. But um, I think that um, the, the whole notion of process needs to be uh, understood in a much more sophisticated way. Um, and one of the problems, you know, with uh, translators is that there has been, you know, uh, a, a dominance among professional translators that, you know, I have called bellatristic. Um, the, the, the idea that, you know, what they are doing is, is an art. Uh, and I'm willing to say it's an art, but that doesn't absolve us from thinking about it. And, you know, uh, in, in terms that are cultural social, political. Um, at what point do these factors, you know, enter the translator's process and how should we document these is a very important question. But uh, process research, uh, I think, has so far, you know, come up in, in ways that fall short of the kind of creative and learned, the kind of, 
socially committed and politically engaged practice that I want to think translation is. Um, unfortunately, uh, we have uh, uh, run out of time in terms of this conversation, which I would love uh, to <laughs> pursue for uh, another uh, hour or, 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 or two, because there's so much uh, in, 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 in what you said, and you know, there's other questions that I'd like to ask and, and, get, and get round to, or uh, some of the questions here on um, that have been put by the, the participants. Um, but I think on, on behalf uh, of uh, everyone, uh, I would uh, like to thank uh, Professor uh, Venuti uh, for uh, an engaging, a heartfelt, uh, committed uh, look uh, at uh, translation. Well, one of the, the books that, that I didn't mention when I was introducing Professor uh, Venuti, what was my first contact uh, with his work, uh, was the uh, collection of essays, which is, you probably feel is back in prehistory at this stage, uh, but no. the, re <laughs> the rethinking translation uh, from 1992. Thank you for mentioning uh, it. Yeah, and I remember reading this, uh, the introduction to that particular collection, and uh, it's one of the, the few texts that I can think of as as, as kind of life changing. I, I I realized that there was a whole other way uh, of considering and thinking about uh, translation. And one of the things that was very uh, prominent that introduction, and which has continued right through uh, your work um, to the the present and contra instrumentalism, I think is uh, the profound ethical seriousness with which you regard the practice uh, of of translation um, and that you feel uh, quite correctly uh, that those of us who think about practice write about or interpret uh, translation uh, have uh, an important public duty to perform uh, which is to emphasize uh, the centrality and importance of translation to our culture and I think you've done that uh, uh, splendidly in, in your work and given us further example of that tonight so uh, many thanks uh, on behalf uh, of us all and from uh, everybody here in the, uh, the, the centre, I'd like to thank you all for uh, att attending. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And everyone who tuned in, thank you so much. Thank you for your encouraging interest. Thanks. So um, if you have um, enjoyed uh, the conversation with uh, Professor Venuti uh, tonight, and would like to see uh, the other events that we're organising in the centre, if you uh, go to our website, uh, which you can see here uh, on the, the screen or follow us on, on social media, uh, you will get a, uh, an indication of various uh, activities uh, that we are in, involved in. If you are particularly enthused by what we do, uh, I would uh, invite you uh, to become a friend of the Trinity Centre for Literary and Cultural Translation, uh, where there are, are various um, advantages uh, for uh, friends of the, uh, the, the, the centre. So you can find uh, information about that uh, on our website, uh, on the, uh, the, the site indicated there on the screen. Um, so again, on behalf of us all here uh, in Dublin and the Trinity Centre for Literary Cultural Innovation, uh, I wish you in our time zone uh, a very uh, good uh, evening and I look forward to seeing you at uh, future events in the centre. Thank you.